at newgarden.church/give, and then you could text your dollar amount to get that number, and then you can drop some money in the offering box outside. All right, thank you, Cameron. And uh, with the Isaac running slides, that was, that was a huge duo, the training program. Oh yeah, not you, but people look small, people. Um, super excited you're here. Round of applause for Lexi and Joey, pure talent, leading us in our show. Super excited to be both of them. Dynamic duo. Um, other things we don't have slides about yet, but super exciting, um, especially why that giving slide is important. July is quickly running by, um, and towards the end of July, getting back into the school season, we're gonna help DuPont Tyler with some school supplies again, getting back into full swing with school, supporting the teachers, doing some luncheons, so um, really appreciate your generosity to help us pour into the school and um, just show the teachers and the kids that there are people here that love and support them, even though we don't necessarily interact with them on a daily basis, so. Um, please support that work. And we've got uh, another mobile food pantry coming up here in the, within the next month. Um, so be sure, recruit some people, uh, bring yourself, bring some friends. Great opportunity to just um, be in community and serving with others. Super excited about that. So, okay, now we're gonna make sure everybody has spoken to each other this morning. So stand up. And in just 4th of July, Tell the person beside, behind, in front of you your favorite firework from the 4th of July. Alexi and Joey are going to come back and continue worship. Mine is the champagne, the gold sparkles, the champagne firework. Just so everybody knows.
When I felt the worst, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. school building you just kind of feel gross you know you're surrounded by people and then you feel more gross so up here I feel a little bit better I have a little bit of space so um, glad that you all are here with us this morning uh, this summer we've been talking about different parables of Jesus and um, parables like the Good Samaritan last week super duper family Sunday who was here for super duper family Sunday yeah it was really fun who Raise your hand if you enjoyed being here on Super Duper Family Sunday. See that everyone's hand is up. And so it was a really fun day um, to be here. Last week we talked about the parable of the prodigal son and about how there's nothing that we can ever do to make God love us more and there's nothing that we can ever do to make God love us less. And today we're talking about a couple different parables from Matthew chapter 13. They're really short and they're right next to each other. So I think we should be able to handle that this morning. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm really excited to, to be here with you this morning, and I'll, I would like to pray for us uh, before we continue. So uh, let's pray. Uh, Lord, uh, we come before you this morning, and uh, we're really, really thankful to have uh, a place to be and a group of people to be with. 
God, thank you for putting those rhythms in our lives that remind us um, of your goodness and love. Uh, God, and, uh, this morning I just I just ask that um, we will hear something from you. Uh, God, if I say something that's not from you, I just ask that it will be forgotten. Um, and uh, God, just please be with us as we as we learn together maybe what, what you're trying to say to us this morning. So uh, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Um, so before we get to Matthew chapter 13 today, I actually have a couple parables that I would like to share with you. Uh, and these ones are not from the Bible, okay? But they, they, they do reflect sort of the stories that we're talking about today. Um, and so these are original New Garden parables that I would like to share with you all. Um, so the first one is about this girl named Sally, okay? What does Sally do for a living? She sells... She sells seashells by the seashore, right? And that's Sally's job. She goes to the sea. She sells seashells by the seashore. And we love Sally. We know about Sally. And so Sally, one day, she's walking along the seashore, and she finds this most beautiful seashell that she's ever seen. Now, Sally, she's an expert in seashells. She knows the, what the best seashell would be like, how heavy it would be, how how clear it would be, and all of that stuff. And she finds the most beautiful seashell in the world. But it's on private property, right? And we all know how expensive beach property is. She can't just buy this beachfront property. And um, so she, she decides that if she gets rid of everything that she has, if she sells everything that she has, she can buy this seashell. And she decides that that's what she's going to do. So she sells all that she has, and she buys this beachfront property, not so that she can have a house with a view, but because she knows that in the sand behind the house is the most best seashell in the whole world. All right? So Sally goes on the rest of her days, and she's content because she has the seashell. Her whole life is complete because she has that. And that doesn't mean not, not days were hard. It doesn't mean that everything was easy for her. But it means that she had what she wanted. She knew she had the best thing. And then there's this other parable. And it's about this person named Brian. Not Brian Nicholas, okay? But this Brian, what does he do? You probably don't know this one. But Brian, he buys brain books at the bookstore, right? And so Brian, he goes about his life and he's always looking to buy the next best brain book. And one day, he's, he's kind of like, um, like that AMC show, AMC or History Channel, but it's like, uh, it's like these two guys and they go to people's garages and they go try to find very valuable things. So he's always looking for brain books, right? And one day he finds the first brain book ever written. It's the most valuable book in the world, and the guy who owns it doesn't even know what he has. But the guy says, here's the thing, you have to buy this whole house, you know, because I don't want any of this stuff, but my, my house is valuable, and there's probably some valuable stuff in there, I don't know. So Brian realizes that in order to get this house, I mean, he, he's been buying a lot of books, brain books, they're not really valuable. He'd have to sell everything that he owns to buy this house, kind of like the Nashville real estate market. And so uh, Brian, he counts the cost, and uh, he, he, he's like, I'm okay giving up most of my stuff, but there's just too many things that I like about my life right now that I don't want to change. So what Brian did is Brian did not sell all the things he had, and he did not obtain that first edition most valuable brain book in the world. And so there's two stories for you. Okay, those are not in the Bible. Uh, today, if you want to open your Bible to uh, Matthew chapter 13, that's what we're going to do today. Matthew chapter 13 has a lot of different parables, but we're talking about two that are very similar, and they have, um, I would say, a similar meaning. Uh, but the stories that I just told you are like the parables we're going to be talking about today, in that there's a moment of discovery, there's great joy, that they have found this amazingly valuable thing. And then there is action, 
you count the cost, you figure out how much it's going to cost. You know, you, you know, if you're going to if you're going to buy something, you got to figure out can we afford it. And then payment, or in Brian's case, lack of payment. Right? Brian decided, you know what? I don't want to seal the deal on this transaction. And so in Matthew chapter 13, we we get a story, two stories from Jesus. Uh, one is about the hidden treasure in a field, and one is about a pearl. Um, and so this is the first one. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought the field. I'll read that one more time because it's short. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had to buy the field. Once again, you've got four steps in this. You've got discovery, joy, some sort of action, and payment. The next verse says this. Jesus goes on, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had, and he bought it. Must be a pretty good pearl. I'll read it again. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and he bought it. Discovery, joy, action, payment. Who can see how these stories are similar to the parables at the beginning? Raise your hand. Yes, this is good. So we're normally in the kids' area. We talk about participation in there. Okay, so thank you for participating this morning. So the two, both of these parables, they start off this way. The kingdom of heaven is like. Um, and we talked a lot about the kingdom of heaven. I feel like Jeff would always talk about uh, the kingdom of heaven. What, what does that mean over the last few years here at New Garden? And something that I always come back to is, you know, I think the word heaven had a meaning to me when I was growing up, and it was where we went when we died. Heaven or hell, there's two places. You either go one or the other. And with Jesus, you go to heaven. That is good. Going to heaven is great. Um, but I think as I've gotten older, one thing that I've realized is that a relationship with Jesus, we have the opportunity to experience a piece of heaven now. So, um, you know, one thing that we talked a lot about is the garden at the very beginning of time, the fall of man, then Jesus or God, he comes in and through Abraham, Moses, Joseph before Moses, and the prophets, starts to re- use the nation of Israel to redeem our world. And then Jesus comes into the picture. And through Jesus, we all have been given access to God. We all have been given that, that access because Jesus, when he died, that that curtain in the temple was torn. All right, we have access to the Holy of Holies. And then the Holy Spirit comes and fills up the people of God at Pentecost, and the church begins to spread and grow, and all of a sudden, fast forward 2,000 years, here we sit. And I think a lot of times we discount how that the kingdom can change our lives in the here and now. But we have been given access to something of great value. Um, and a lot of times I don't think we count the cost correctly. And so uh, in this kingdom of heaven, our lives get to be transformed. Uh, it should transform the way that we live, the way that we work, where we work. Uh, it should you know, change so many things about our lives. And I'm not telling you when to quit your job, you know, but you know, what, what do we do with the money from our jobs once we have it? How do we raise our kids? How do we discipline our kids? Uh, What sort of media do we want to intake on a regular basis? Jesus and the kingdom of heaven should influence all of our decisions in our life. And I think a lot of times we're like, yeah, kingdom of heaven, man. I go to church on Sundays, 10 minutes late because that's what time our church starts. 
and it's pretty good. You know, preaching's okay, but it's good to see people, right? And I think sometimes we have dumbed this, this idea of the kingdom of heaven down into something that's later or something that doesn't influence our whole selves. Um, but I believe that the kingdom of heaven should be this beautiful, valuable, transformative thing in our lives. Um, which makes this the question. So in, this, in the two parables in the Bible that we talked about this morning, uh, the two main characters, they decide that the kingdom of heaven, because it's like a, a hidden treasure, or it's like a pearl, they decide that it's worth going all in for. And here's my question this morning, is that do we actually believe that the kingdom of heaven is best? Now, I know we're in church, and if I asked for a raise of hands, we'd all be like, yeah, that's right. Kingdom of heaven is best. One thing that um, I appreciated a couple weeks ago uh, when uh, Jeff Brown from Woodmont, I wasn't here, but I, I think he was up here uh, in, in the screen talking to us, and he was talking about assurance. Where is our assurance from? And I think if we're being honest, uh, sometimes we don't put all of our our hopes, and we don't we don't have all of our trust in this kingdom of heaven that that life with Jesus is truly better. You know, sometimes we think I would like a few more assurances in the form of some green dollar bills or a house that's in a good area that's going to grow over time, and all these different things. And I'm not knocking uh, you homeowners out there. I would love to join the, the club soon. All right, um, but sometimes. I don't know. I just feel like we don't put our assurances in the right place. I don't know if we, if we really believe the kingdom of best and it would be worth going all in for, but I think sometimes in our lives we, we're like, okay, but that, that part of my life is, is good the way that it is. And that can be anything, you know? Uh, that can be really anything, like depending on where you are or where you're from, uh, what your life experience is. That's different for all of us. So I couldn't even stand up here and name different things, because I don't think I could hit everybody in this room. But what I can say is that, for me, sometimes that, that, that trust falls a little bit short. And I start like, yeah, the kingdom of heaven is best. I want to live in the kingdom now. I want Jesus to change everything about my life. But, you know, I still want to, like, get way over-invested in the Titans games on Sunday. You know? I was telling Madeline, it has like 10 weeks until football season. I'm ready. Um, but just things like that. It's like, you know, if, if the Titans game is at the same time as something else, do I consult Jesus on that decision, right? Um, is what's happening uh, in, in this area of my life, is that worth, you know, letting my kids grow up and not be part of their lives. Is that worth um, things like that? And so we actually believe that the kingdom of heaven is best, which I think in, in our minds we're all like, yes, kingdom of heaven is best. If so, how is that changing our lives? Um, how is that changing our lives? If uh, most of being a Christian in 2022 is going to church, um, I don't really know that that's what Jesus was talking about. Um, you know, if you read Acts, uh, they have this amazing moment at Pentecost where um, they're all worshiping together and the Holy Spirit comes and there's tongues of fire and thousands of people are baptized and they say, I want to change my life. And Sometimes I think we have these moments of, man, I can see clearly now, I want to change my life, and we just go off to whatever we were doing before. But in Acts, that's not what happened. Immediately, these people go from here to now they are meeting together in their homes. They're sharing everything that they have. You know, they're sharing meals together. They're sharing finances together. Um, yes, it's a very different world than we live in now, but 
What part of that can we reclaim here in 2022? And I don't have all the answers to life or anything like that, but can we, can we commit to being a group of people that think about those types of things? Um, how are we going to invite Jesus into our lives in a way that changes our lives? Are we going to be a Sally, right? Are we going to be a Sally who sees that thing of great price and decides that's worth it? I'm all in for that. It's going to change how I raise my kids. It's going to change uh, how we navigate our finances. It's going to change um, what I think about other people. It's going to change how I treat uh, waiters and baristas. It's going to change those things. Or are we a Brian who thinks, yeah, that's pretty cool. And I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I think that's the, the most valuable thing. But do we believe that the sum of all of our other stuff is better than that? That having all of this other stuff is better than the relationship that we can have with Jesus in this new kingdom of heaven that we can experience now. I think these are questions that we have to ask ourselves as responsible followers of Jesus. And I think a lot of you in this room have. I'm amazed daily by being part of this church and getting to see the actual commitment that we have made uh, to being part of our community, to being a blessing in our community, um, and encouraging others to do the same. I know there's people in our community that, that see us and maybe they don't believe everything that we believe, but they're not here on Sundays, but they see a group of people that is in it for Jesus, and not in a way that turns other people off, but in a way that is welcoming to others and it wants inviting other people to join in. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of talk uh, and, and I'm, I'm probably in this world more than you because I went to Bible college. I have a lot of friends who are in ministry and there's a lot of talk out there about what can we do to make Jesus more sexy, right? What can we do to make being part of a church this like cool thing? What if, what if we had like better systems in place to streamline things and all of that? And I'm, I'm not bashing efficiency, but what I will say is that, in my opinion, the, the most attractive thing that would attract me to Jesus, to a different way of living, is to see people experiencing joy, who have counted the cost, who are fully invested in a new lifestyle. They have allowed Jesus to transform their lives because there's a lot of things in life that people like, but they don't change anything about their lives. But something that is transformative, like I think we would agree that the lifestyle that Jesus has outlined for us, love of neighbor, caring for orphans and widows, uh, putting others before ourselves, I think these things are attractive qualities. And so this morning, uh, I, don't, I don't know where you fall on the spectrum of that. Um, maybe you haven't ever thought about how, how does Jesus change my life? Because I think a lot, a lot of times people would ask, uh, people have asked me that, you know, um, and I've just, I, I'm like, yeah, I know the right answers, but is it really doing that thing to me that, that, that am, am I really there? And we all go through periods in our lives where we're, we're hot and we're cold, and that's normal human behavior. That's part of life. Um, but I believe that God is calling us to something that is worth what God is asking of us. Jesus tells his followers to count the cost. He is literally asking them to give everything. Uh, his apostles uh, did a lot of amazing things after his exit from earth, um, but they also endured a lot of hardship. And I think we really, really like being comfortable, myself included. I, I prefer it always, right? But a life following God sometimes invites us out of our comfort zones. 
in a good way. And so this morning, um, I will leave us with that. Um, I'll pray for us, and then Madeline will come up and lead us uh, into communion. So let's pray. Uh, Lord, we come before you this morning, and uh, we're thankful that that you have provided us with a a a life um, that is worth what you are asking from us, God. Um, thank you for uh, providing. This, this beautiful, beautiful life for us to live. God, we just want to invite you into our lives in a way that, that changes things. God, change the way that, that we love our families, change the way that we love our friends. God, drive us into your world in a way that is committed to goodness and love. And Jesus, name we pray, amen. Good morning. So this morning before church, I was in the cafeteria doing my thing, setting up the kids' area. And I can usually sometimes overhear some things, whether it's in the lobby or in the hallway or somewhere. And this morning I hear this, dad, 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 dad. And I realize it's coming from the kitchen and that uh, someone is trying to get Josh's attention. And it made me giggle a little bit, and I wonder what was the conversation that's happening in there. But it made me think about our relationship with God. And it, children have such a dependence on their parents. And maybe that is something you hear a lot. Dad, Dad, or Aunt Michaela, or hey you, I don't know what the kids around you are saying. But there's a knowing inside kids that you have answers that I don't have. I need something from you, and I'm gonna get your attention one way or another. And even when kids are, you know, defiant or do think they know better, there's still something in them that knows at the end of the day that adult who cares about me is gonna take care of me and knows more than I do. And it reminded me of this passage from Mark chapter 10. The disciples had been getting kind of cocky and came to Jesus, and they were like, who do you think is the best one of us? And this picks up in Mark 10, chapter 13. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch them and bless them, but the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. The kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. When Michael was talking about this idea of letting Jesus transform us and transform our life in a way that's countercultural. And our culture values independence so much that I think we can let that sink into our relationship with God sometimes too. And Jesus is here reminding us, be like these kids. These kids know they need me. These kids want me to bless them. They want to come and receive from me. And just like we are talking about the kingdom of God, it belongs to those who are like these children. So that's my encouragement to you today, is that no matter how old you are, there is still someone who knows more than you, who wants to provide for you, and has already given and sacrificed so much for you, for all of us. And that's what we get to celebrate today. Every Sunday, every day is communion, a time where we can remember Jesus, encourage each other, and spend time together in the knowing that we can be reliant on him um, and know that Jesus wants to be there for us, wants to provide for us. So we've got two tables up front and one in the back. I'll pray for us and we can go to the table. Dear God, thank you so much that you know better than us that you know more than us, and that you love us and provide for us. And I pray today that each of us will 
strive more for a childlike faith that depends on you and looks to you for answers, God. Thank you so much for Jesus and all the reminders that he gave us um, to be that way and the sacrifice that he made for us. In his name we pray. I've heard a thousand stories of love they think you're alive, but I've the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleasing, that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father to it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. It's who I am. Transform our priorities, 
Um, and fill us with your spirit to do your work. And if you see with Christ, amen.